Thank you so much, uh, Ran. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. I'm very happy that uh, um, my colleagues, my colleagues, are also participating into this um, this conference and uh, sharing their um, their expertise. I think now I can control the the slides. Let's see. Yes. Okay. So um, these are my general disclosures. Um, I don't have any disclosures that. Um, that has uh, anything to do with this um, this talk. Uh, I'm a, a, a consultant for Passage Bio and Ionis. Um, I participate in as a TI or a sub I on several uh, clinical trials. I've re I've received an unrestricted educational grant from Takina. I served on several advisory boards for, from Foundation, and I'm the chair of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of the United Decodicity Foundation. And um, I'm on the editorial boards of Neurology Genetics, Frontier in Neurology Genetics, Neurogenetics, and uh, Journal of Medical Genetics. So um, for some of you, that's going to be uh, all things you know. But uh, I was thinking that perhaps there were uh, newer uh, Chinese that were diagnosed recently that may want to uh, have a bit more background about uh, genetics and uh, leukodystrophy. So, uh, what we call the coencephalopathy is any brain diseases where the white matter is affected, whether or not it's the disease that's acquired, like multiple sclerosis or genetics. Uh, leukodystrophy is what we think a primary genetic disorder affecting the white matter disease, the white matter, sorry, and genetically determined leukoencephalopathies uh, overlap with leukodystrophies and include disorders um, that could have primary neuronal. Um, uh, vascular or systemic uh, disease with uh, secondary white matter abnormalities. So <clears throat> leukodystrophies are genetic diseases of the white matter. They're not that rare. Um, they're collectively, they're <clears throat> they have an incidence of approximately one in uh, 4,700 lives birth. Um, they're devastating diseases affecting previously healthy children and leading to progressive disability and early death in most cases. So a little bit about myelin. So um, myelin uh, is the white matter of the brain and I don't know if you can see my arrow. Can you see it? Yes, okay. So this is the myelin and so this is the white matter and this is the gray matter. Um, so neurons, which are these cells, uh, have a cell body and an axon and the myelin is wrapped around the axon. It's a little bit like an electric wire when you have um, the part you put in the, in, on the wall that is actually the cell body, it's plugged here uh, in, the, in the gray matter. And then you have the wire that goes down uh, to the arms and legs and is, is uh, covered by like a, um, an um, a plas plastic or insulator. Uh, and that allows to protect the actual wire or the neuron and allow for fast electric activity to be conducted through uh, the neuron. Uh, the cells that are producing the myelin are, ca are, ca are called oligodendrocytes, and every oligodendrocyte uh, are, um, uh, myelinate several different axons. So we classify leukodystrophies as hypomyelinating leukodystrophies, where we uh, think it's a, in, it's a developmental disorder where there's insufficient myelin deposition, and all of the other disorders where the myelin is initially normal, but then um, uh, becomes abnormal, uh, and that includes all the demyelinating diseases. So when we look at the MRI as physicians, um, so there are different sequences. So this one is called T1, and these ones are called T2. So on T1, the white matter here is white, the gray matter is uh, dark gray, uh, and it's the reverse on T2. And the way we, uh, we characterize the, whether or not it's hypomyelination or not, um, is we look at the T1, and the T1 in hypomyelinating disorder is normal or almost normal, while the T2, instead of having almost black white matter, the white matter is, um, is white. But when you look at other pathologies, the white matter on T1 is very abnormal, as you can see, it's very dark uh, versus it should be white here. And it's very bright on T2. So it's, it's, it's white, but it's brighter than you see in other pathologies, in, in hypomyelinating disorders, I mean. So, so this is how we, we first think about uh, what the patient has. Uh, and when you talk about hypomyelination, it's important to understand a little bit about myelination. So myelination starts in utero and progress until adult, adult life, 
but it's really around age two that the myelination is almost complete. And in order to analyze the brain scans that we see, we have to understand which structures myelinate when. So uh, we know that um, the myelination produced from uh, if the myelination occurs from bottom to top, from the midline to the uh, to outside, and from the the back to the front. So now um, some uh, information about uh, PAL3 PAL3 related leukodystrophy or 4H leukodystrophy. Um, so it's important to note that like all of the work that we've done, uh, we've done with international collaborators. And as you can see, it's not quite an up-to-date map, but we have collaborators uh, from around the world. And we work very closely with um, Dr. Van der Veer at CHOP and Dr. Uh, Wolf uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, so uh, 4-H is, a, it is, a, it is an autosomal recessive disease, meaning, meaning that um, the child who has the disease has two non-working copies of the gene, uh, and the parents have um, one working copy and one that, is, uh, that has a mistake on it. Um, so every pregnancy that the mom is going to have with this dad uh, has a 25% chance of having a child who has two um, copies with um, a, um, a mistake on it and an affected child. So um, this disorder was initially described uh, by different groups. Um, so it was described and had different names. Uh, so um, so uh, there's a group who called it leukodystrophy with oligodontia. Uh, Dr. Wolf uh, described it as a taxa delayed dentition and hypomyelination. There's another group that described it as 4-H syndrome for hypomyelination, hypodontia, and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Um, there's another group who described it based on the MRI features, so hypomyelination with cerebellar atrophy and hypoplasia of the corpus callosum, and we described it as the clinical features that we saw in patients from Quebec, and we called it tremor ataxia with central hypomyelination. It's only in 2011 that we found the first two genes that cause this disease, so PARAR3A and PARAR3B, and then we realized that all of these disorders um, were, were, were basically the same, and uh, we proposed to call them 4-H leukodystrophy or polar 3 related leukodystrophy. 2014, together with Nicole Wolf and um, numerous international collaborators, we looked at the clinical features of 105 cases. Uh, in 2015, we found the third gene causing this disorder, polar 1C, and we started to understand uh, why mistakes in these genes cause uh, disease. Um, in 2018, there's another group who found a fourth gene, which is extremely rare, um, but uh, is also causing a few uh, cases uh, of 4-H, polar 3K. In 2019, we looked at a cohort of patients with mutations in polar 1C and highlighted the most common clinical features. And in 2021, we uh, looked at the 150 cases and um, looked at the endocrine, the, the hormone abnormalities in these patients. So um, the uh, disorder is caused by mutation, two, co two mutation, uh, one on each copy of the gene, because we have two copies of each gene um, in polar 3 8 polar 3 b polar one c and polar 3 k So um, a little bit of uh, background information about uh, POL3, the RNA polymerase 3. So it's, uh, you can see it here. Um, so it's a 17 subunit complex with different subunits. And there are several that has been associated with 4A, so polar 3 a and polar 3 b which are, are the largest and are very important um, because this is where most of the action happens in the, in the complex. There's polar 1C and there's also polar 3K there that were associated with disease. Um, so if you remember your biology, um, probably in my days, it was high school, third year, um, you have millions and millions of cells in your body. Uh, every cell has a nucleus, and the nucleus contains all the DNA. You get uh, one copy of each gene from your father and one from your mother. Uh, and there's different steps in order to produce proteins uh, to, to do multiple things, um, and including making your myelin. So um, when you, so there's the first step is transcription, where the DNA is transcribed into what we call RNA. And then there's translation, uh, where uh, the, the RNA is actually trans, trans, translated into protein. And the role of PAL3 is actually to do transcription of some small RNA. 
uh, that are very important for the for, for the cell uh, to live and have um, and function normally. So basically, uh, one of the things that Paul uh, three transcribed are uh, the tRNAs, which are, impo are, are important for translation. So what we know is that there is a problem with uh, producing protein in this disease. Um, so these are the, the main papers that I talked about, uh, the characterization of polar tree, patients with polar tree and polar tree B and polar 1C mutation. And uh, this is the uh, main paper that, we, that I talked about, about endocrine abnormalities. Um, so uh, we try to divide the disease's manifestation into neurological and non-neurological manifestations. Uh, so neurological manifestations are uh, predominantly uh, are, um, characterized by what we call cerebellar features. So the stru it's, a, it's a structure behind the brain. And these are uh, ataxia, so unsteady gait, dysmetria, so impre imprecise movement, dysartria, so difficulty with um, enunciation, and tremor. Uh, there are other, there are other manifestations, so stiffness it can be there, either spasticity or dystonia or both of them, and also some cognitive involvement. So some kids have learning disabilities, Others have intellectual disabilities and others have regression in their uh, learning and cognition. And then and if you look at the um, non-endocrine, not non-neurological manifestation, you have uh, the teeth abnormality, so hypodontia, uh, oligodontia, et cetera. There's also uh, hormone abnormalities, which we call hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is the most common one. And then you also have eye abnormalities and the most common one is myopia. So dental abnormalities are uh, variable. You can, you can have different types of abnormalities. So delayed dentition is one of the common ones. Um, uh, hypodontia, so some teeth missing, some teeth are smaller. Sometimes there's paste, uh, as you can see in, in some of these pictures. Um, there are specific non-neurological manifestations to polar 1C patients. So polar 1C also causes treacher Conan syndrome, which is a uh, a disorder that uh, causes craniofacial um, um, feet abnormal abnormalities. So this patient both uh, had uh, craniofacial abnormalities of Treacher Collins syndrome, but also had 4-H. Um, so there's a new overlap between the two diseases. So in the cohort that we looked at, sorry, we had one patient who had Treacher Collins and 4-H, and the other patients had um, mainly 4-H, but some of them had some abnormalities in their facial, craniofacial development. And we also saw non-neurological manifestation. And as it is, it is the case for other patients with polar tree and polar tree mutation, not all patients have all the clinical features. Uh, the most common hormone abnormalities is what I said before, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And this is basically absent, delayed, or arrested puberty. About 550% of patients are, have a short stature, and um, there are other hormone abnormalities that can be seen, and most commonly hypothyroidism. Um, so there is specific MRI features that we see in these patients. So I've put you here on the right upper corner, a normal brain MRI. So as you can see, the white matter here on the T2, which is, which is these two sequences, is black, and then you see here is white. Uh, but there are specific abnormalities or structures that are preserved. So these patients have a thin corpus callosum. This is the structure with the arrow here. Usually it's much thicker than that. They also have a, the cerebellum, which can be um, smaller, and that's the case for this patient. And besides the white matter abnormalities that are quite diffuse, there are structures that you see are um, darker. So this structure in particular, uh, the dentate nucleus, and then this structure here is the optic radiation. Uh, this structure is the corobus pallidus, and this structure is the anticholesterol nucleus of the thalamus. So when we do see all of these features on the MRI, uh, it's almost certain that this is 4-H. So that's very helpful. And like we did, we like many um, rare diseases. Uh, when you once you diagnose the disease, you know, the spectrum enlarge quite significantly. So you you find a typical patient what they have, and then you realize that there are patients that are different, uh, but are still have the same disease. So as we saw as we saw earlier, there is the typical presentation onset in when the child is a toddler or early childhood with either motor uh, problems or uh, in the patients that presented later more cognitive involvement 
uh, we've had the, we've described uh, a series of patients that have a very severe form of the disease with onset in the first two, three months of life, severe developmental delay and regression, difficulty swallowing, and failure to thrive, and unfortunately, early at death. And we've also seen patients that have a uh, later onset disease uh, in the adult uh, adulthood, and where the MRI um, was diagnosed was done for another reason, and they were diagnosed with hypomyelination, whether or not they had symptoms or not. And then since then, um, there has been other diseases. Uh, so this syndrome, Wiedemann Hot Insurance Prince. Hatzestrot syndrome is a syndrome where you have, um, it's a very early onset syndrome with um, uh, um, progeria, progeria, so early aging, uh, and other features, which also is caused by mutation in polar 3 and other diseases, other G, and also polar 3D and polar 3GL. And then um, some, some patients don't, don't have uh, hypomyelination, so they don't have a leukodystrophy. They only have stiffness in the legs and arms, or they have only the ataxia and the cerebellum that's smaller. Um, and there's also one new, uh, uh, one new, one new entity uh, with mutation is only one copy of the polar 3D gene that leads to another disease as well. So the spectrum of the disease has expanded quite significantly in the last um, uh, few years. So there are things that we know about uh, that what helps us predict um, what, uh, what to expect in this disease, but we still have quite a bit of work to do with this. So um, it's hard to have, so what we call genotype phenotype correlation is when you have this specific, a specific mutation, you wanna be able to predict what the patient will, um, will look like and how they go, all the disease is going to evolve for them. But this has been um, difficult because there are hundreds of mutations and most patients have two different mutations. So it's hard to have patients that have exactly the same combination of mutation. But in general, what we've seen is that patients with polar 1C have a more severe disease course compared to polar 3A and then polar 3D. But of course, this is very general. We have patients that are completely different. We have very mild polar patients with polar 1C mutation. We have more affected polar 3D patients. So this is just a very uh, wide generality. The, um, these specific uh, mutations, the 1771 minus seven and minus six are associated with uh, basal ganglia involvement. So they have more movement disorder. And if you have the 1771 minus six or minus seven, then this is an, an, an stop, so a mutation that don't lead to any protein, then you have the severe form of the disease. Um, and this, this uh, polar 3D mutation, the common mutation that most patients with polar 3D mutation have, um, is very, it's, it's, we think is milder than others, um, and that we talked about already. And then in terms of prediction, if you have one, two affected family member, uh, we think that sometimes they, they, they look the same, but uh, sometimes they're very different. So it's hard to predict the, the disease course of one of a sibling once one is already been affected. <clears throat> so the next step, um, so we need your help because a uh, natural history study is crucial to prepare for clinical trials. And at this point, uh, we, there's a lot of things we don't understand. So what we've tried doing, uh, so we have a, a natural uh, history study, both retrospective and prospective. So looking in the medical records, but also seeing patients, uh, which has been difficult with COVID, but we are hoping to be able to resume that at some point. Um, and then we also have a, uh, and that's done by uh, Hilia, which is a, a master's student, soon to be PhD student. And then um, we, will, or we want to look at normal developmental milestones uh, in patients with 4 H, and that's done with, by Elia and Alin, who is a medical student, uh, so that we understand uh, how they, they develop initially before they plateaued or regress. And that's going to help decide when uh, the treatment uh, may be effective. And then uh, we have uh, uh, Anitis uh, who is working on the craniofacial uh, characteristics of the patients, the teeth abnormalities, and she's also interested in looking at bone health. Um, and finally, uh, we are interested in understanding the impact of the disease on patients and parents and caregivers, uh, on the quality of life of the patients and the stress that the parents uh, are um, do have uh, living with a child with 4-H, and that's done um, by Laura, who's also a graduate student in my lab. 
so we do have questionnaires that we would be so grateful if you would be uh, if you would accept to fill them. It's uh, we send them about every six months, um, and it take, they take. I know it's a lot of questions and it takes time. It's about an hour to fill the entire uh, questionnaires. So please feel free to reach out to me uh, either by uh, in my uh, McGill email or my nuhc.mcgill.ca email, which my team can answer to as well. So I want to first acknowledge patients and families. I'm I have I'm already one minute late. I'm sorry. Uh, we have uh, collaborators at McGill, which I don't have time to name everyone. We also have international collaborators for which we're very grateful too. Uh, and these are uh, my employees. I have uh, two uh, research associates uh, working uh, at the bench and three clinical research assistants. Uh, these are my graduate students working on different projects and uh, medical students and residents um, also working on this project. So um, these are the funding we've, ha we've had over the years. I'm very grateful for the IAF Foundation who just recently found our mouth uh, program with um, a gene therapy um, uh, approach that we're hoping uh, will um, end up in, uh, will be translated into a clinical trials. So I thank you very much.